Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of September 16th, 2013. Before we get started, I just want to throw out some kudos and thanks to Dr. Ali Farzad. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is not Bruno Mars, okay? Dr. Ali Farzad is our emergency cardiology fellow, and uh, I have not heard him sing before, although some people may mistake him for Bruno Mars with a beard. He's not. He is way smarter and more talented, and um, what he has done over the past year is amazing. He has taken our EKG cases of the week going all the way back to September 2011, and he's put little summaries and bullet points on our website. So for those of you that are logging on, whoop, let me change that to red. For those of you that are logging on and watching these on YouTube, you're missing out on this. Go to the website at our university, www.ekg.umem.org, and there's a searchable feature. There is key points and take-home points that he's put on the website. He has been staying up day and night, weekends, holidays, uh, you know, burning the candle at both ends to get this done. And he's done a wonderful job. We've gotten a lot of great feedback from people who are looking at the website and uh, it's really, really gotten a whole lot better. So thank you very much for all your hard work, Ali. And uh, also I want to mention that this is the start of year number three of these EKG cases of the week. We started this the second week of September 2011, and so we are just now starting our third year. My thanks to everyone who has sent in cases, and I've got a lot of cases that are pending, and uh, so there is no end in sight. I think as long as people have chests, we're going to have plenty of good EKGs to talk about. So let's get on to this week's EKG. This was actually sent by Dr. Jesus Trejos. Let me try that again. Dr. Jesus Trejos. Hopefully that's a little bit better, but uh, he is a first-year resident at the University of Costa Rica, and he wanted to make sure that uh, we send a shout-out to his faculty mentor, Dr. Manrique Umania, um, who helped him with the case analysis. Jesus was taking care of a 45-year-old man who presented to the emergency department with two hours of worsening chest pain, shortness of breath, and there's a huge concern on his vital signs there. Obviously, he is bradycardic, and he's got concerning symptoms. So this sounds like an unstable bradycardia. We'll talk more about uh, unstable uh, bradycardias in just a second. Blood pressure seemed to be uh, not terrible, um, and uh, his mental status appeared to be okay. They got a quick 12-lead EKG, and here is the 12-lead EKG. Now, it's kind of a simple EKG, and it's also kind of a bit more complicated EKG. The simple part of this is to look at this and say this is bad, okay? So now we've gotten the simple part of this EKG down. It's bad, obviously, because there's ST segment elevation in the inferior leads and also in the lateral leads. And when you look at the rhythm, you also notice that there is P wave osis. In other words, there's a lot of P waves that are just kind of hanging out, loitering, not really doing anything useful. Some of the P waves seem to be conducted. I don't even know which P waves are being conducted. What I do know is that the P waves are marching out at a rate of about 115, and they march out very regularly. And this photo was taken at a slight angle, so over here they don't really get, they don't march out quite as regularly, but they are regular P waves, and the atrial rate here appears to be about 115, and uh, perhaps it's no coincidence that the ventricular rate is exactly one third of that. All right, so there's a three to one um, atrial to ventricular ratio. The atrium is exactly three times faster than the ventricle. And what that means is that if there's an exact multiple relationship between the atrium and ventricle, it cannot be complete heart block. So this is not a complete heart block. It's also obviously not a move, it's one. Uh, so, you know, I just kind of, I kind of hedge here when I see too many P waves, but there's a ratio like that. I just call this an advanced AV block. So let's just be comfortable calling it an advanced AV block and, and leave it at that, okay? Something's gonna need to be done about this. Uh, advanced AV block and um, the patient has an unstable bradydysrhythmia. The ventricle's beating too slow. We'll get to that in just a moment. And then the other thing that you'll notice is that there's ST segment elevation in the inferior leads. 
because ST elevation in the lateral lead, so there's an, at the very least an inferior and lateral STEMI going on. And the other thing that you'll notice is that there's ST elevation in V1 and in V3, but ST depression in V2, and we talked about that last week. When there's ST elevation in V1 and V3, but you're going the opposite way, ST depression in V2, that is highly specific for a right ventricular MI, okay? So this is an inferior and lateral and right ventricular MI. And if you're into coronary anatomy, uh, this is something that can happen if somebody has a very dominant right coronary artery, which also has lateral branches. So the patient is developing an infarction of inferior right ventricle and lateral um, parts of the heart. So it's a big MI and there is a concerning advanced AV block here as well. So that's essentially EKG interpretation, perhaps not too difficult. So we'll talk about a couple of other things. Uh, first of all, this is an unstable bradycardia. I'm sure everyone would, would agree with that. This patient is having an acute MI in the presence of a bradycardia, and that makes this an unstable bradycardia. And when you use the term unstable bradycardia, what you're essentially saying is that this patient needs emergent treatment of the rhythm. And I like to think of four times or four scenarios where a bradycardia or tachycardia, but a bradycardia in this case is considered quote unquote unstable. In other words, we need to treat the rhythm emergently. The four criteria that define unstable are if somebody's got a severe bradycardia with ischemic chest pain, or if they're in acute heart failure, or they have a decreased level of consciousness, or if they are hypotensive. Okay, uh, so this patient meets criteria for having an unstable bradycardia because they're having ischemic chest pain, cardiac ischemia on the EKG, and that means we need to do something about this rhythm immediately. If, if a person had none of these four, they were simply bradycardic, but had none of those four, you wouldn't need to treat the rhythm emergently, okay? Um, you could probably watch them for a bit, maybe set up for some other type of procedure, but in terms of emergent treatment, in other words, we need to go right to ACLS and do something right now. Those are the four criteria that define unstable bradycardia and need for immediate treatment. So what is the treatment for an unstable bradycardia? ACLS talks about atropine and then pacing, transcutaneous or transvenous. They also throw in options for isoproterenol or epinephrine or dopamine and um, we're not going to go all the way down that uh, line. If you want to go straight to pacing anybody with an unstable bradycardia, I don't think you'd ever be faulted. It's a perfectly safe and reasonable thing to do. Give them a little sedation and just go right to pacing. When do you use atropine? Well, you know, atropine is mainly useful for patients that have severe bradycardias that are due to excessive vagal tone. Atropine won't work if the bradycardia is not due to excessive vagal tone. So what, what are the types of bradycardias that are generally due to excessive uh, vagality? Um, and that's not a real word, but uh, that's what I'm going to say. Uh, well, sinus bradycardia. If somebody has an unstable sinus bradycardia, give them atropine. If somebody has an unstable Mobitz 1, try some atropine. But Mobitz 2, third degree heart block, advanced AV block, you know, it's probably not going to work. And my personal opinion is if you have an unstable bradycardia and you're looking at a Mobitz 2 or an advanced AV block or a third degree heart block, skip the atropine and just go right to the pacemaker. Pacing is, uh, you'll never be faulted for just going for the pacer. Give them a little sedation also. And also, of course, don't forget to treat the underlying condition, which in this case means the patient needs antiplatelet agents and needs to get lytics or go to the cath lab. And that's what ACLS says. As a good emergency physician, you also don't want to forget about tox and metabolic causes for unstable bradycardias. Remember, we've talked in the past, severe hyperkalemia can induce brady dysrhythmias. So make sure you got calcium in your back pocket, throw in some sodium bicarb um, for hyperkalemia. Calcium is also useful if it's a potential calcium channel blocker overdose. Glucagon, if it's a potential beta blocker overdose. Digibind, if it's a potential digoxin overdose. So again, ACLS is not written well 
for tox and metabolic. But you as an emergency or acute care physician or, or healthcare provider, you've got to remember the things that ACLS doesn't address, tox and metabolic, all right? So in this case, you know, this is, this is clearly a STEMI, so we don't have to worry too much about that. And we're going to go <clears throat> for that, and we're going to go for that. And that's exactly what, um, what Jesus did. So they started out with some antiplatelet agents, aspirin, anoxaparin, clopidogrel. They're getting ready to, uh, to send the patient for percutaneous coronary intervention, get the cath lab ready. And in the meantime, they start working on a venous, uh, transvenous pacemaker. Unfortunately, the patient decompensated rather quickly, went into a ventricular tachycardia, then V-fib. They ran ACLS. They did everything right. And unfortunately, despite their best attempts to save this patient, the patient died. And this was a large MI involving multiple areas of the heart plus a, a terrible Brady dysrhythmia. Um, and unfortunately, you can do everything right. And as you know, some patients are just not going to make it anyway. But we can learn from this case. We can learn about the unstable bradycardias and also just review a little bit about the EKG as we have done. So quick take home points once again. Unstable bradycardia. What defines the term unstable bradycardia? In other words, you need to treat the patient's rhythm right now. Four criteria. Are they having ischemic chest pain? Are they in acute heart failure? Do they have decreased level of consciousness? Are they hypotensive? If they have any of those four things with a severe bradycardia, go ahead, call it unstable bradycardia and treat the rhythm acutely. And with the treatment for unstable bradycardias, you know, people remember the atropine. Atropine is probably best just for the sinus brady and Mobitz 1. You won't be faulted for going right to a pacemaker. And also, please, as a good emergency physician or emergency healthcare provider, don't forget about tox. Don't forget hyperkalemia, the metabolic causes, and make sure that you are always focused on treating the underlying cause, not just focus on ACLS, but treat the underlying cause as well. So my thanks to uh, Jesus for sending a case that gave us an opportunity to talk about bradycardias and uh, an interesting rhythm, and uh, I hope that was helpful, and I look forward to talking to all of you next week. Bye for now.